Welcome back to the show. We are so happy to have you here. I am Dr. I am. We are. You are? We. Who we, am I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Dr. Gwen Palafox. No, I'm kidding. And you're Dr. Dave that, Waters. Yeah. Well, we could play, we could play a little topsy-turvy, tipsy, yeah. worthy. This is a wow. this is a great wow. segue to our topic, right? So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk about OCD, yeah. OC, OCD, uh, and stimming and what really the difference is. But I I, yeah. I like the kind of topsy turvy thing because it it uh, a lot of sort of learning to deal with um, obsessions is about reordering. Right. And so the, the not being able to tolerate things that aren't in a certain order or aren't in place or whatever that kind of thing is. But we have done an episode on on obsessive compulsive disorder. We, we defined it that, you know, upset. The obsessive part is the thinking, the mm -hmm. thoughts. Um, the compulsive part is usually the behavior. So like feeling like you have to do something. And that disorder, we can talk a little bit more about today. Uh, we were just taking a quick glance at the DSM criteria before this. And um, anything that's disorder in the DSM really means that it impacts your life significantly. And it's like taking up enough time and enough energy that it's become like a problem, right? Um, so OCD is something very specific. And o just OC, you could say that. And then we've heard about, we hear people use the word I'm obsessed all the time, especially in, in common language now, like I'm obsessed with this TV show or I'm obsessed with this sweater or something like that. And really, you know, you can use it in that way that you're really in tune to something or it really jazzes you or you like it, right? And mm -hmm. that's not too far from what actually happens with OCD, but the, the, let me sort of back up. So the, if we're going to talk about the difference between stimming and OCD, there is some overlap. So let's sort of clarify that. First of all, there's going to be folks out there that have um, thought about this in their head or they've had conversations with people. And there is some overlap. A, a lot of folks will get misdiagnosed as OCD who are really autistic, mostly because of stimming behavior or repetitive behavior. Um, but the big and both you could make an argument for and say that both of those things are um, comforting behaviors of some kind. And particularly though with stimming in autistics, it's a it's a regulating behavior for when you're overstressed, right? It, it's a way of having that repetitive motion that's supposed to be self-soothing in some way. So we talk about, I mean, everybody can um, visualize a crying baby and a parent holding that baby and them rocking. You know, almost every baby likes rocking. I mean, I think it probably because that's what happens when you're in the womb. You experience that rocking a lot. It's soothing. Animals do this. They'll do rocking. And so it seems to be something about our neurology that kind of settles it down. Yes, there's going to be some babies that don't like to be rocked. And then babies that like to be like swung. I've, I've seen some people like really swing their babies. And I'm like, you're going to hurt the babies. Like, no, they love this. And other babies that if you move them too much, they hate it, right? And that holds true for us as adults too. But there's going to be, um, we, rarely as adults, will we sit there somewhere like in a work meeting. In my mind, I might want to be doing this rocking, but I'm like, okay, I probably have to mask that because my colleagues aren't going to appreciate that or something like that. But I can, you know, do something in my head or whatever um, that might be a form of stimming just to deal with stress in the meeting, let's say. Okay. But really, hardcore OCD um, is, it's not necessarily neatness. It can be, right? Um, people that have to organize things on their desk or have them at square angles and that kind of thing. And so you could be a neat neck and want to do that and not be OCD. Um, you could do that and have OCD in terms of the, the barrier that sort of goes over is it feels like a have to. It's no longer a, ooh, I like when everything's where it should be. It's like, oh my God, that thing's off by a, a quarter of a millimeter and I have to do it or it's, I'm not gonna be able to concentrate on anything else. Now we're starting to get into the OCD land, right? 
um, hoarders are actually, uh, it, that's really kind of like a, a type of OCD. It's this feeling of if I don't grab everything and keep it, something bad's going to happen. Or it, it is almost like a felt sense. I've heard people describe it like it's an itch that you can't scratch, but it also is just like a, a feeling that you have, right? So some folks, you know, the stereotypical, and this does actually happen, I had this going on for me in my early 20s before I started therapy, was I would lock the door at night, and if it didn't feel right the way I locked it, I'd have to do it again. And it got to the point where I'd do like four or five times in a row, or I'd have to do it an even number of times. Um, and that was one of the things that I noticed. I'm like, this isn't, this can't be normal. Maybe I should, maybe I should get some therapy. That in addition to some other things. Interestingly for me, what it what it ended up being, I mean, I do think my, so there's OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, there's also what's called uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder or personality type. So you know people in your life that are a bit more obsessive than others. So you can have sort of um, temperamentally who you are, you might be a little bit more obsessive. And I think autistics, we come by that naturally, right? So for me, in dealing with other stuff I had from my childhood, that went away. That level of OCD went away. I, I know we never directly talked. We, we talked about it in therapy. We never directly like addressed it. Like, oh, next time it happens, stop yourself from doing it. It just sort of went away. And that really let me know that that was like a control thing that I had. I, I probably felt so out of control in other ways. Um, I didn't feel like I had efficacy that if I could do that, and it really was a felt sense for me. For me, it was a sense of like evenness in my body. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't like an itch for me. It felt like things were not symmetrical. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, and that is something I can still feel from time to time. That can be something that I'll want in cleaning the house or whatever, right? But I know it's artificial and I know it's something external to me that isn't real, right? And so um, I can, if I, I use this example with my clients all the time, let's say that I have a pet and I notice a lot of pet hair, you know, the pet hair tumbleweeds as I would call them, right? And you know, you need to vacuum because there's too many tumbleweeds. Now I could at 11 o'clock at night when I'm supposed to be going to bed, I could say, oh my God, I have to vacuum. And you stay up too late and you're making your family upset because now you're making noise at 11 o'clock at night because you can't wait till the next morning to vacuum that's kind of a problem, right? It, it's getting in the way, it's causing conflicts with relationships and those kinds of things. If it's something like no one else is home and you could or could not vacuum. And I, we have a joke in my, uh, where I teach, like when you're working on your dissertation, your house is never as clean because you're engaging in avoidance, but it also is like the sense of, if everything else is in perfect order, I can concentrate on what I'm doing, right? So yeah. when I was doing that, I started to learn the difference between feeling like I had to have it in order and, oh, I'm feeling out of control in my life. I'm feeling I can't focus. So I know the cat hair has nothing to do with that, but I'm gonna let myself have this right now, knowing it'll make me feel better, but it's totally artificial because the cat hair does not correlate at all to me working on my dissertation. And then the urges would go away. It's like, oh, Maybe I'll do it now. I could do it later. It's not that big of a deal, right? So I'm, I'm giving that example because it really does overlap. And I think that's why there's some confusion about that with folks because there is overlap um, in terms of like having obsessiveness uh, and OCD. Now, where does the stimming come in? The stimming um, can be repetitive, but it really is when you're stressed and um, you need something to focus on to bring your overall level of stress down or your arousal down, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it may be a repetitive movement that to the outside person looks like obsessive compulsiveness, lining up toys and things like that. But it really can be that sense of symmetry for someone, let's say, visually could be a stim, right? I've seen, um, I follow someone uh, on Instagram now uh, who does videos of just like, soothing things and they're really short videos but they're like ah oh. and then i have another one where it just shows things like how things are made in factories because it's a repetitive thing and you'll see it labeled as asmr that that mm -hmm. thing where you see things over and over it, it tends to for humans tends to ground them that's really what stimming is right so the stimming thing certainly could be disruptive 
Um, it could be <clears throat> not comfortable for people seeing it or watching it or hearing it, um, or it could just be pretty harmless, right? It could not cause problems for folks. So we've talked about ABA in here, and if you've got a kid who's doing those things, if you're just working on extinguishing stimming behaviors, that's a problem because now that stress level internally is going to go up. It really ought to be about like redirecting or saying this one, yeah, go for it. You know, it's fine. Just do it or line up all your toys. It's not hurting anybody, whatever. If you still are able to go to bed and let it go. It's not an issue. As soon as it starts to flip into that, I have to, and it starts to impact daily living, then it becomes a problem, right? Yeah. So I always like to tell folks and I give permission to myself included, um, certain stimming stuff I'll let myself have. And I'm aware of things that I do when I'm with people or not with people, because I might get embarrassed by doing something in front of somebody or not, or I just notice they emerge more when I'm by myself. I'm like, oh, look at that. My foot's going crazy. And I wouldn't do that if someone else was sitting on the couch because I know it would bother them, right? So there, there can be a big difference, but I really do think they, um, they exist on a continuum. I do think there hasn't been a lot of research done on like fMRIs, functional MRIs, or PET scans on stimming behavior. I, there's been a lot done on OCD. If I had to put a good amount of money on it, I would have to say there'd be some areas of the brain that light up like OCD, but I would bet there'd be other areas that don't look like OCD in stimming. It would have to yeah. do more with like a calming things you can do to calm your brain down and, and bring anxiety down. That hyper-focus on something like a special interest is really like a version of stimming. It's just not repetitive, but you're focusing on it. And that's that way of calming you down and all those things. Yeah, that exist thought, on that I call those like thought stims. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you know, I mean, Dana, I think, you know, what can be really challenging, um, from sometimes what I see parents kind of struggling with or like other neurotypicals struggling with is the idea that sometimes stims, which are calming to the mm -hmm. system versus a compulsion or an obsession, right? So yeah. a thought or a behavior, um, which is activating and distressing. So yeah, exactly. functionally, those are two, two things are different. Yeah. That many see the stims, which can start off as um, calming and regulating, move into and over to the continuum of compulsion. Mm -hmm. So yeah. a good, right? A good example would be like the lining up the toys that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, yeah, in the beginning that's okay, but heaven forbid the wind come or one gets knocked over and then yeah. something happens. And then now we are in a compulsion because yeah. I've got to fix it and now I'm aroused again, right? right. And so right. it is such a tricky line. Yeah. Um, Dana and I have done an episode on um, stimming and really encouraging our community and anyone that supports an autistic to mm -hmm. not eliminate stims. Right. Like, please do not see them as nasty, right? Yeah. Um, because the reality is that we all have these regulating things, twirling mm -hmm. hair, shaking your leg. I mean, things that have become very socially, if you will, acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe irritating. Like, I mean, I just was on a flight and the guy shook his leg the entire time. It was only, <laughs> a, the flight was literally an hour and one minute, but I wanted, I mean, I just in my mind was like, he yeah. really needs this, you know, yeah. but yeah. Oh, gotcha. it really took yeah. energy for me to tolerate the fact right. that my seat, my seat was shaking. Yeah. Yeah. It was so Which annoying. is funny because if, if it was you doing it, it wouldn't bother you. Right. So it's yeah. also like what's outside of you and what is irritating to other people for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. So that was like really interesting, but you talked, you, you talked about the, uh, like if, if you line up your toys and one gets knocked over, um, that the other thing we really haven't talked about with OCD that isn't necessarily the case for stimming, I think at all, is in OCD, there's this kind of magical thinking. And by mm. magical, you know, I don't mean, I don't mean that a pathological in a judging way. I mean, like if I, if I lock the door just the right way, mm. my, I, no one will break in. Yeah, nothing bad will happen. And so yeah. the, um, the, 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 the therapeutic, antidote to that is to tolerate the one toy knocked over or 
not doing that. And then, you know, as a therapist, I'll give this for homework. I'll say, okay, okay, so this one thing, don't do it. And then you're going to be anxious because you're going to want to do it. But I want you to know what happens when you don't do it. And then, of course, you pray to God that nothing bad happens. Because if something happens to happen at that same time, <laughs> that person screwed up for life. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but you, you do. You actually... It is sort of like that stress inoculation where you have them wait longer and longer and say, nothing bad has happened. You're realizing that you're using this as a way to feel in control, but it's a magical way of being in control because it, you know, proverbial don't step on a crack because they break your mother's back kind of thing. Yeah. Try stepping on a bunch of cracks and then your mom's okay. And you're like, oh, okay. So you almost sort of prove to yourself that what, what happens when things aren't the way they you need them to be? Everything's okay, and that's really the only intervention that truly, really works, and lets people let go of it. Because then, then you look for opportunities to be like, "Oh, I'm going to put this off kilter on my desk just to see what happens," you know. And then you learn to kind of tolerate those things out of place a little bit. And everybody's always afraid, oh, now I'm going to turn into an absolute total slob. And I'll be like, you know, the chances of that happening are astronomically small. Because if you're wired this way, you're never going to go completely the other way. Um, so let yourself have some um, some gray in that and see what happens with it. And then it usually takes some of that compulsion part out. Yeah. You know, it, it, we. I think uh, to your point, as humans, we learn better from experience than from yeah, talking yeah. about things. Right. Exactly. exactly. The, you know, yeah. the other two is like, you know, stress inoculations or stress testing, you know, exposures, what we would call a mm-hmm. graduated exposure in psychology. I think the thing that people forget about, and I see this happen in ABA a lot, it's, it's one of my pet peeves actually, is if you were going to expose someone or stress test someone, you better hope or you better have, not even Mm -hmm. hope, you better have ensured that they have a repertoire of coping. Oh, yeah. Because what really bothers me is when people do graduated exposures, Mm -hmm. ABA, classic old school drill and kill ABA, um, we used to do this kind of wait. Yeah. You know, yes. keep, you know, hold the thing that they wanted the most with a timer. And it's like, no, just sit oh. there and wait for increasing periods of time. And, you know, uh, for me, and I didn't know this, you know, 25 years ago when, when I did this, but now with my experience, you know, and, um, it's just like, what did you call it? Drill and kill? Drill I, and I call kill? it drill. I just, it's such a director, but I, I call it the drill and kill days where it's like, yeah. we're just going to drill this. And we're yeah. just going to drill it and drill it and drill it and drill it until it's like, yeah. you know, in, yeah. um, which with no collaboration, with no idea mm-hmm. that that is such uh, it, ugh, anyway, I mean, I could go on and on. It's like so shameful. Like I think about my, yeah. my involvement in those days is so, is so shameful, mm-hmm. but you know, we never, what we should have been doing is we should have been helping them enact a coping strategy. Right. Anything. Right. You yeah. know, counting, yeah. um, yeah. doing like a forward fold, like get, you know, yeah. get that, get that Vegas stuff, like, like get, you know, do some grounding, um, right. talking yeah. ourselves through it, encouragement, like what the mm-hmm. hell? Like mm-hmm. I don't, so. Yeah. Almost like a replacement or some, you know, anything you can do to make them in the driver's seat. Cause that drill and kill just makes them more feel anxious. Like- people are really mean and they don't let me do what I want to do. And that's what's learned. It's not about respect and how can you do this so you move around in the world better. It just makes you yeah. fearful of the person that did it to you. Yeah. And, right? and what, what other things come up, right? Resentment, mm-hmm. anger, because there's a power differential. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not only in yeah. therapist child, but in adult child. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. now holding all your reinforcement, all the things that you love dearly and yeah. I, you yeah. can have access to them. Like, you know, and then, yeah. and a lot of times it's with individuals that don't have good um, ways to effectively communicate. Right. So yeah. it's, just, yeah. it's like not even a double whammy. It's like a quadruple whammy yeah. as I look back and, yeah. Um, and I'm not even saying like DAR floor time is also the way to go because I feel like that can be a little bit loosey goosey mm-hmm. as well, just mm-hmm. from a therapeutic intervention. But mm-hmm. the idea is how do I understand this person's profile? And then how do we collaborate where they're consenter, like consent? Yeah. Yeah. To the things exactly. that are hard. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even yeah. little ones. Exactly. How do yeah. we empower them with consent? That's um, so hard because they don't, you know, you can't use language to promote understanding like you can with an adult. Right. You right. can't yeah. say, well, that makes sense. You want to watch that show over and over because of this the way your neurology is and it appeals to this and that and the other thing. It's because you're autistic for they're not gonna, a little yeah. kid isn't going to understand that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's challenging. I don't think we work hard enough to make mm -hmm. it accessible. Um, yeah. And that would always be my, that's always my challenge, which is like, what mm -hmm. have you done? It's always, to yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always harder, any animal you're training, it's harder to get them to do something when you use reinforcement only. It just takes more time yeah. versus using punishment. Yeah. But we know now when you use punishment, that just makes that animal anxious versus yep. if you only use the, the positive part and really work with them. So you try to, it takes longer, there's more effort to it, but it's worth it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because, and you know, I, you know, Dana, I think, you know, um, an episode on self-efficacy or locus of control is going to be mm -hmm. a really interesting episode for us to do um, mm -hmm. to really kind of help people understand what that means and what that yeah. means in people's psychology. But yeah. this idea of stimming an OCD as being on a, on a continuum, yeah. I think is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and that how do we know when one crosses over to the other? And again, that is is it calming or arousing? Right. That yeah. is. The other yeah. piece that I really love that you brought up because I didn't have it in my thick skull in mm. this way, and I appreciate the dimension, is that, um, you know, the thought stimming? We were talking about the thought stimming. Yeah. It's like I need something to focus on to bring the stress down because I'm yeah. in an environment. And yeah. so I see that a lot, and I see this a lot um, with clients that um, script – Mm -hmm. They script mm -hmm. from movies, let's just say. Right. Yep. And we're in these kind of um, stimulating environments and they're scripting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. That's a right. good example of yeah. I'm focusing on something to manage the stress I have in this environment. Yeah. What's so challenging then is when we want them to function in an environment where it's like, I need you to have more environmental awareness so that you're safer. Yeah, like I am yeah. so stressed by my by where I am that I'm just trying to stay, and so this is why now we have a dependence on another person to bring them through that environment. So it's, why, should they be yeah. in that environment? Yeah, is the question. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question too. And you were talking about scripting, and I'm I can think of um, uh, when you get a room full of autistics, there's a lot of that going on, but it's also because we're socially connecting, but also can connect in that way. The scripting in itself becomes a version of, of connecting. But yeah, it is that kind of, I'm gonna go to, that's more of a cognitive sort of stim, which I think you tend to see a little bit more in adults, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Stimming is a good indicator. I think for me, it's it can be a litmus test um, of the amount of stress someone is kind of bearing. Uh, exactly. How much stress is bearing on the system. Um, yeah. so stimming is always a really good indicator for me. I mean, if I can, I always check in with my clients. I just want to do a check-in. Where are you? Yeah. You know, I've got, I've created, um, kind of this gauge with numbers and colors. Um, okay. and it's about like how, like how much I can participate in my environment versus like, I'm super stressed or like, it's like, I'm all in, I need to get out of mm. here. Like, and uh, so yeah. it's yeah. more about like an environmental, like, how am I do? how am I in this environment? Because mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter what I want you to learn or what you want to learn. If you're right. in those, you know, yellow, orange, red zones, we, yeah. you know, um, no learning is actually going to happen because you're going to be in a survival mode. Yeah, um, exactly. And I think we just yeah. oftentimes, we just expect, we expect people to put their head down and just work through it. Well, sure I think neurotypicals can, but the, the, the stress yeah. load of when you're overstimulated by something and if stimming is the only way to regulate, putting your head down isn't going to help. It's just going to add to that stress even more, right? Yeah. So yeah. trying to apply a neurotypical solution to a, a neurodiverse person, diverse, divergent person isn't going to work. I mean, it, it, yeah. Right. Well, that's ableism. Won't. Right. So, well, <laughs> yeah. So, well, there's that, that whole thing too. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there's just that ism. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm guilty of this, Dana. I mean, 
you know, um, when I want to impose what I think should mm -hmm. or could and um, be happening in this moment with my own neurology, right? right. Um, right. I, I think that's where we that's where we go off course, you know, yeah. instead yeah. of like how ready and able is this person mm -hmm. to do yeah. what is being presented in this moment. That right. is, a, you know, a different way of looking at it. But I really, you know, um, how many times have you and I seen OCD misdiagnosed oh, because God. we've got a stimmer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is a problem. Yeah, because the treatments are totally different. And even the yeah. awareness that you try to uh, foster is totally different. And then it's you're like, shaming someone, they're harmful. taking away skimming. And yeah, now they're going to be even more stressed. Yeah. Or really judge themselves like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? Now yeah. I'm doing these things and my therapist said this is really bad and I'm a worthless, horrible thing because I can't stop this stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the story because, that I told about my own kind of OCD versus stimming is really telling because dealing with my uh, need to control because of uh, trauma I had in my history, that went away as we dealt with the trauma, right? Stimming never went away because it's a regulatory thing that would be there at times and not be there at times. And um, for me, all through my 20s and even till now, riding my bike, I realized, oh, that's a repetitive movement. I've never liked riding with other people because it takes that kind of Zen piece out of it for me. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, so that is actually, I start my day every day with a version of stimming with riding my bike. And I, I started doing that around the time I got into therapy in my 20s, it was my go-to. So it, they may not be obvious things for stimming, but um, it really is important that you try to figure out what it is for you. Is it stimming? Is it OCD? Are they overlapping? And then um, what if, if it is stimming and you're getting shamed from your environment about it, how do you educate the environment to tolerate it? Or is there something else you can do? You know, like the guy on the airplane, thank God he had a psychologist sitting next to him because someone else might have murdered him before he landed uh, or shamed him like, God damn it, stop it. Oop. We have to do a bloop, a bleep. Um, but that to understand that clearly that person was probably afraid of flying and, you know, yeah. uh, all of that. And yeah. again, shaming someone for a fear or, you know, because that's really what's behind OCD. It's all fears of things. And yeah. shaming one for someone for being afraid, that never works. Oh, don't be afraid. What's wrong with you? Oh, thank you. You've cured me now. You said to tell me to stop, so I'm going to stop. I mean, that doesn't work. That easy. Thanks. <laughs> um, you know, maybe we could even look at it and, and, you know, at the heart of anxiety is fear. Yeah. And yeah. I think, yeah. you know, yeah. you know that that's important for understand. Anxiety is not just stress. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's stress about the future. Yeah. You are fearful yeah. about something that's going to or may happen. Yeah. That is the heart of anxiety. And so... Maybe what we can even see is stimming at its core is Ooh. regulating the neurological system. That's right. OCD at its core is trying to regulate anxiety. And sometimes it adds to your anxiety because if you yes. don't get that knob turned just the right way. Right. Or the. It, because, it makes it worse. Right. Or yeah. the rug tassels are not straight. Exactly. Or my hands exactly. continue to be dirty because I might have touched something else. That's or, right. You know, whatever That's that right. might be. Um, I like this, you know, like when I feel out of control of it, when it controls mm -hmm. me, when I yeah. have to, that's when we're in the OCD places. And yes. I know this is really hard for, you know, autistics who don't have reliable communication. Yeah. yeah. Because then the environment starts to make decisions for them. Inevitably, right. I see this. this um, is, yeah. and, and to be fair, the environment is making good observations because they're also traumatized by stimming moving into the OCD realm. Right, right, right. So, but, yeah. you know, but seeing it new, in a nuanced way um, and, you know, how do we contain anxiety? How do we let stimming go? Like, I don't know, yeah. like, how do we, but th this is challenging. I'm not saying this is an easy thing. It's incredibly challenging. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Yep. But let's be careful. Like, let's be careful. Let's be mindful that stimming and OCD are not the same, even though they might have some overlaps. And even though they yeah. might, we might see them on a continuum, 
but um, yeah. and a regulatory continuum in its weird way. Yeah. But what is the heart of the matter? Um, and how do we deeply understand? Yeah, that? And, and you brought something to my awareness as you were saying that, and that is um, even so with the stimming thing, like lining up toys or something like that. I have found it useful to just own it like out loud. So I'll, you know, and part of that was the process of coming out as autistic and talking to my students and whatever that is. And I'll say, oh, there's, you know, I'm doing, this is a stimming thing, or I need to do that, or just to kind of make it clear and known that this is what's going on. Um, you'd be surprised at how much acceptance and tolerance you can get from the environment for that. Right. I'm thinking of my sister does that. She's always done the foot thing. She's not autistic, but she's done that when she's nervous and it drives me nuts. And I think now if we were on a flight somewhere and she were doing that, I would actually feel kind of loving towards her. Like you go, you do what you need to do. I'm going to sit here and have a massaging chair for this flight because it's moving my chair. You know, I would try to find some way to frame it. If I knew why that person is doing that now, right. we all reach our limits and we can't deal with that stuff. But it, it's just as important for the person doing the stimming uh, as the person who is in their life to understand the whys and hows and all that. And you're not enabling someone into pathological behavior, right? So me not making my wife go into an elevator or drive into a tunnel, that's not going to help anything. It's just going to make her resent me. It's going to make her feel stupid. And I'll, and she'll say, when we were first together, she'd say, oh, I know it's Dominic. I said, no, it's fine. It's not a big deal to take a different street. Now, if it were, if we had to drive 3000 miles, that would be a problem. We had to go around yeah. that far. But typically a lot of these things are just easy to, to do. And maybe I even can share them. We go to a baseball game or something. We try to get near the aisle seats just so, you know, you don't feel as trapped or if you have to go to the bathroom 6,000 times, you don't disturb everybody. There's no harm in that. Yeah. So it's always, it's always going to be more useful if you can talk, out what your needs are, what it's serving, right? It gives you awareness and gives the people around you a little bit more awareness too. And you'll notice if you're describing an OCD kind of thing, I have to check this knob because I'm afraid if I don't shut it the right way, our whole family's going to die. You may even start, you say that out loud, you're going to be like, wow, I sound crazy. Yeah. I say crazy in a playful way versus doing something so you can fall asleep or, you know, you'll, yep. you'll start to be able to tell the difference too. Yep. Yeah, I like that a lot. And, um, you know, surround yourself by people who want to get it and get it. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I think that's just another piece. And, and that might be a good kind of idea for the human, for, for humans, you know, yeah, uh, yes. in general. But this idea that, um, uh, you know, being able to say things out loud or being in the habitat. I've been using the word habitat a lot lately in my work mm. because mm -hmm. for whatever reason, people get like plants when they're in the right yeah. habitat are thrive in whatever thriving, may, maybe that plant really is only going to bloom once a year. Let's just say if they're in the right habitat, but we accept yeah. that or yeah. animals for that matter. I don't know why we don't do that with human beings. It's like, what's yeah. their habitat? And I'll say yeah. that to families and parents all the time. Yeah. What is the habitat in which they thrive in? If you're going to pull nice. them out of that habitat, it better be dang worth it. Like, uh, yeah, that makes perfect is, sense. Yeah, right, because it will suppress it will suppress them or oppress them. Yeah. So this idea, though, Dana, what you're saying is that if you are a stimmer, okay, mm -hmm. are you around people? It is mm -hmm. does your habitat mm -hmm. include people who get it? Yeah. Yeah. That's its own it's like, Totally. Yeah. I, I mean, it. don't be an orchid in the middle of winter in Seriously. Calgary. So that's not going to go nothing well. Nothing survives right? in the middle of winter in Calgary. <laughs> it has to go I dormant. This, yeah. I, I say this lovingly because I'm from Calgary, which is why Dana brought up Calgary. Um, but uh, yeah. But I'm from Chicago. No, but, Nothing but, lives in Chicago in the winter either. Trust right. Me. Do you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. I don't yeah. understand why we understand this instinctually yeah. with other yeah. organisms. It's so interesting. And I, what I was thinking too, when you said that too, is like purebred dogs, they're bred for a certain thing and they have, yeah. they have different temperaments. Yeah. And why aren't we looking at that in our kids? And if you look at temperament and 
you know, the, the environment, the habitat makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. I love that. We, yeah. we have a family who brought a it, Iditarod dog from Alaska mm-hmm. back to California, mm-hmm. Southern California. And she struggles because yeah. Yeah. she's not doing what she is bred to do. Right. Um, and they get that. Yeah. I mean, they know that yeah. and they do the best that they can with her. Mm-hmm. But you just see where that temperament that genetic load yeah oh yeah of yeah like you know running miles and miles and miles a day uh, and, and being thinking, cold you know and being cold and, to, thinking yep. and thinking yep. and thinking yep. and think like that yep. you know that that's that's the habitat that's the environment yeah. that that dog does best in um right. i mean i think about this with my springer all the time i mean mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they're really it's a working be, dog it's a working dog it's a working dog who job. works along yeah, yeah mm-hmm. who works alongside humans Right. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. when he's disconnected from a human, you know, yeah. he opens up my freezer and eats half a cheesecake. But whatever. <laughs> we all deal with stress in our own ways. <laughs> so I've done that though. I was, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it really is a great example because it's, I always worry that I'm using too many animal examples from my years in vet med. And I'm like, I hope people don't think I'm reducing them to an animal. But in this case, the analogy really works because we're not any different than that. No. Right? We have differences and and temperamental differences, and sometimes kids have very similar temperaments to their parents, and sometimes they're wildly different. Yeah. And now you've got a, a habitat the parents have set, and the kid is trying to live in this habitat, and it's not going well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we use this. You know, the reason why we use this um, metaphor or analogy, oh, Dana. I'm always really bad at which one that is, but mm-hmm. you know, the reason why that here, what we're saying is like, if we can do this yeah. with a plant. Yeah. We should do it with humans. Exactly. That's really what we're saying, right? When we yeah. use like these things, we're like, give yeah, them some so grace. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yourself right. and yourself some yeah. grace. I mean, yeah. you know, think about it from a parent perspective. You're not yeah. also wired maybe the same as your kiddo. Yeah. That, and you're trying to create a habitat that works for you. Um, That's what, that's tough. That's yeah, hard. It's really tough. Yeah. So not going to go well. Anyway, yeah. um, so, it, you know, maybe what we could do uh, or what we could ask you to do as an audience um, are, can you tell the difference? If you are a stimmer, mm, can you yeah. tell the difference between a stim and an OCD? Like what, yeah. what is, yeah. what is that? Um, yeah. I'd love to see even, other people describe it so we can get a more yeah. rich picture of it. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Get more nuance, get, get more, mm. get more, um, get more narrative. I think surrounding yeah. it is so helpful and, you know, if you're still here and you want to support Dana and I, you know, uh, a like and a subscribe is really, really helpful for us. Mm-hmm. And commenting is really helpful for us yeah. to continue to do this. I mean, Dana and I are going to do it regardless because we That's right. love it. And it's really fun mm-hmm. for Dana and I um, to meet and talk about these these topics. So anyway, yeah. um, be well, everyone. Thanks for listening and watching if you're on the YouTubes. Thank you. Bye, everyone. The YouTubes. The YouTubes. (laughs) Bye.